Now that we've gone through the basics of a VLM, we talked about lift and pitching moment. We're now gonna see how we can compute induced drag. And most of the ideas we'll talk about would uh, extend quite generally to any other method, but we'll, we'll put it in the context of a VLM uh, towards the end. So uh, this idea we're talk about is uh, called a truss plane. We'll see in a moment what that is, or I guess right now. Uh, if you remember back to the first homework or if you're not in the class early lectures, we looked at computing forces on a body, not by integrating pressures right on the body, but by uh, integrating force or velocities and potentially pressures far away from the body uh, by using a control volume analysis. This is particularly effective for drag. For lift, uh, integrating pressures is, is uh, we can do with a relatively coarse description, but for drag, because typically in aerospace, we have streamlined bodies, that means that the projection and the dr drag direction is quite small. So to get drag correct, we've got sort of, you know, some high pressures and some low pressures, uh, pressures on both sides that are mostly canceling out. And so we have to resolve them pretty accurately to get a good value of drag. On the other hand, if we look at the velocities or pressures in, in a far field, far away, uh, we don't have to have quite that course or that resolution. And so we can often get a much more accurate prediction for drag. So uh, while this idea is seen in many contexts, this PhD dissertation of Steve Smith has a, a really thorough and nice job of explaining some of these details and derivations and how well these methods extend. But one of the things that come out, comes out of this is that, uh, as we've discussed, uh, but here's the formula, the induced drag, this is that drag due to lift that we've, we've talked about, this, this new component of drag that exists in three dimensions, is a function of velocities computed on a plane far away. So we call this the truss plane. It just means that it's uh, quote unquote infinitely far away. So you can think of it as the projection of the wake or moving the wake far enough away that these are essentially infinite vortices. And uh, as we would expect, we only need to know, you know, some velocity components, and, and this is an area integral over this plane. Well, <clears throat> there are two types of wakes we're going to talk about. The, the real wake, the way, as the wake physically evolves, is what's called a force-free wake. And that means, as we've seen with these pictures of the airplanes, they create these uh, counter-rotating vortices, they create a mutual downwash on each other. So the wake descends, it moves. So a force-free wake means we just let the wake evolve under its own um, influence. And it's going to descend, it's gonna you know, dissipate and do some things, but roughly just depicting that descent, it's gonna come backwards something like, or come backwards and down like this, right? And this would be uh, the, the trailing vortices that we're visualizing and there would be some strength gamma associated with a, with a given trailing vortex. Well, in this case, if we put our thumb in the direction of the gamma, it's going up on one side of the trailing vortex down the other. But in any case, it induces a velocity, right? The induced velocity is gonna be perpendicular to that. That wasn't really so great. Let me try that again, draw a little better one. Well, this is perpendicular, right? So if it was straight back, it'd be straight down washed, but in this case, it's perpendicular. So if I took the components, of that velocity vector, we see that there's a component in the x direction, we call that u, right? So that would be this u term here. However, what we note is that uh, for, for uh, you know, realistic aircraft wakes, this u term is gonna be very small because this descent rate is not, you know, is, is, is relatively slow compared to the, the propagation speed going backwards or basically the speed of my airplane here. So uh, this, angle is relatively shallow and so this component of velocity is pretty small and once I square it it becomes really small compared to these other terms and so uh, often we can ignore that and fortunately what that means is that if I considered a wake coming off the aircraft and I didn't actually let it evolve I just took whatever existed at the plane of the aircraft and I just projected it straight back we call this a drag free wake because it's here in the direction of the drag. So it's all the forces that it induces are in this direction, perpendicular to the drag direction. So it's not inducing any uh, forces on the wake in that drag direction. That this wake, this drag-free wake, 
would result in this same equation, meaning this equation with the U part gone. So uh, that's fortunate because this is really easy. This is actually quite hard. I have to do a simulation where I, I uh, compute the influence of the wake and let it evolve over time and keep that numerically stable and with sufficient density in my uh, discretization so that I'm capturing you know, the velocity field correctly. That's computation expensive and, and difficult to do. Whereas this is very easy. I don't really have to do much at all. I have my circulation that I'm already computing. Um, that velocity distribution right here at the edge or the trailing edge of the air or the air wing or aircraft. And I simply just project that into the far field. I just take those trailing vortices and just extend them. So that's that's uh, much, much easier. So the formula that we have now, and again, it is approximation, I guess, but it's a, a very small one. Those terms are very, very small. Um, is as follows, right? So I have to integrate over that plane. And uh, turns out I won't derive this, but we can, as we've seen before, change area integrals to line integrals and things like that. That this is equivalent to following one half row times the integral, a line integral over the wake of the normal wash times the circulation. So this is a line integral. So in other words, if I go out into the far field, here is uh, this area, right? This is that tress plane. So here I am in this plane. I'm looking at it here from the back. So my wing is far upstream and that wake has evolved. And let's just say, here's the trace of that wing wake. So it's, you know, kind of come back like this. And all I need to know is how gamma varies along that wake, which we're already computing in the VLM. And then I also need to know what the normal wash is, or for a flat wing, it would just be the down washes along that wing. And I simply take the integral just along this wake shape. And if you go look at Steve's dissertation, you'll find that this works uh, with shock waves um, and, and that'll add wave drag to this calculation. Um, and this is quite nice. Uh, you might notice actually that this looks very similar to what we came up with with lifting line theory, uh, we saw this, we kind of used this analogy of uh, kind of a cut Joukowsky like analogy, although that's a little bit of a misuse of the, the, the equation. Um, or in that derivation, we came up with this, right? The induced drag was rho times the downwash times gamma, or more generally, it would be the normal wash times gamma. We see that this is uh, twice what we got in lifting line is twice what we get here. Um, and the reason why this works, and we touched on this before, is that in the near field, we have semi infinite vortices, right? If I'm looking at the plane of the wing, I'm evaluating my forces here, the trailing vortices are extending only in one direction, so they're semi infinite. Whereas if I'm at this truss plane infinitely far away, then I've got vortices that extend infinitely in both directions. And so the downwash is twice as far. If you remember the velocity induced downward by a infinite vortex is twice that of the semi-infinite. So we get this factor of one half. So these are actually gonna be the same. In fact, this formula is actually what justifies what we got in lifting line. As we saw when we did the lifting line theory, the downwash that we computed was actually not correct because we were neglecting the bound vortex, which we need to have up here. And so that whole idea of taking that arc tangent and getting that downwash over the velocity was, was uh, not quite right. However, this is, and we could then relate it back and see that, that that approach works. And we also motivate how that might work from that mutual induced drag theorem. In any case, this is what we need. This is our formula uh, that we're gonna use. So again, to summarize, um, what we do is we take our circulation distribution that we compute or our wake, we project it out here into the far field. And now we just have to do this line integral. So let's now do this in the context of a VLM. Here's a depiction of our VLM. Recall that we have these horseshoe vortices. These lines are coincident. I separated them slightly just visually so that we could see, uh, it'll, it'll help us in this discussion, but they are actually aligned. So we have a horseshoe vortex that lines up with this one and we computed the circulation associated with each horseshoe vortex, right? So that's gamma one through gamma n. That's what we solve for in the VLM. With this discretization, our integral becomes a summation 
So this is an integral of rho over two, and, and I'm only depicting half the wing, but you know we should do this over the full wing. We can also take advantage of symmetry like we did before, or like I mentioned before, although I'm not gonna discuss that, you can see that in the book. But here's our discretized version, right, of that integral. Okay, so we know gamma already, more or less. Uh, we need to calculate this normal wash. So let's let's break this down real quick. One thing that we're gonna need actually is that we see that, uh, so this, this circulation is going upwards, right? That's the direction, recall for this vortex, then it comes across, then it goes down, right? It has to be constant and continuous along the horseshoe vortex from the Helmholtz vortex theorems. Uh, whereas for the next one, it's going up, across, down, and up, across, and down. And so each of these pairs that are coincidence are partially canceling. And here we can see that, so this is now back view. So here's X, Y. And now if I take that wing that's lying this way and I rotate it flat, so now I'm looking on this back view here. I've color coded it to match. So this would be the back view, right? This circulation uh, is drawn this way, which is the same as I'm showing here, right? My curl my fingers in the direction of the circulation, my thumb points in the direction I'm going, whereas the blue is the opposite and the red, right? And same idea, you can see that in the middle, each of these are, are or we're each match, they're partially canceling. So I'm gonna call lowercase gamma i the value of this circulation um, sorry, I had a phone ring. Uh, lowercase gamma i, the value of the circulation where we account for, the, for both of them at the same time. This is just gonna simplify my summation uh, just to kind of do this up front. So gamma i, lowercase gamma i, I'm gonna define it this way. Um, we're gonna start at one, two, and go all the way down to uh, n plus one of them. I guess I numbered that up above, so I didn't kind of redundant for me to do that. So gamma, is equal for, for, for case one, we can see it's just equal to gamma one, right? And it's actually a minus gamma one because this is in a, uh, a negative circulation direction. So we're going to define going uh, counterclockwise as positive, which is typical, although you, know, you can choose the convention, we just have to stay consistent with it. So we're going to call that a negative gamma one um, if i equals one. Conversely, well, and let's do the last one. If it's n plus one, we see it's just gonna be gamma n here. So it'll be gamma n if i equals n plus one. For every other, I have to count for two things, right? So uh, for i equals two to n, it's going to be um, a plus for, well, let's see, it's gonna be a plus for the one on the left and a minus for the one on the right. So that would be, gamma i minus one minus gamma i, right? Because it's a plus for this one on the left and a minus for the one on the right. <clears throat> okay, so that's that definition. All right, so what we need to do now is we need to, uh, one, more, one more definition we're gonna use is that to um, choose this integral, we've computed gamma at the center of each panel, right? That's what this gamma corresponds to. Uh, Basically, we're defining it at the center of each panel. We, we, effectively, what we've done, if you recall, if we look at this on the side view, um, we have this kind of step-like behavior, right? And I'm running out of room, so I'm just drawing it really tiny here, but gamma is constant. So if we're gonna take the middle, uh, you know, the edge is a little bit ambiguous. So we're gonna take the middle as our location of the value of gamma, kind of like you do in a trapezoidal rule. So what I also need to do is calculate my normal wash or my down wash for a flat wing at the middle the middle of each of these panels, if you will. So X location is where I need to calculate it. So we're gonna call that, um, we're gonna call this location here, Y bar, Z bar, the bar will indicate a middle. And these will just be my regular nodes, right? So this will be Y, J, Z, J, and this one will be Y bar, J, Z bar, J. So the J bar will be between the node J and J plus one. So just to write that very explicitly, Y bar, J is one half of, yj plus yj plus one, and the same for z. Okay, so now we have what we, uh, some preliminaries. Let's do the actual calculation here and figure out, uh, figure this out. Um, actually, I already wrote this all out for you. So I'm just gonna have to step through. I was gonna write it out so I could step through a little more slowly. But first we need to figure out the the normal wash at some arbitrary other panel induced by some arbitrary other 
lowercase gamma, right? This, this vortex, so we've lumped it into one vortex. We could have kept it as two, right? And used the big case gamma, but this is just gonna simplify to do it once. So I've got this lowercase gamma. It's some distance r, i, j, from the center of this panel. So i is referring to this panel where I'm calculating things at, j is the gamma here. And you'll remember that v theta, the velocity induced by a uh, vortex is just gonna be gamma times uh, r, or gamma over two pi r actually is all it is, right? It's just gamma over two pi r. However, I need to figure out the direction, right? Normally we've just kind of figured out by inspection and I can see that in this case, if I've got a circulation as shown as like as this, this is positive direction, then it's gonna induce a velocity perpendicular to that. And that's gonna be up as I've drawn it in this direction. But I need a mathematical way to do this so that I, you know, a computational way, I can just look at it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna realize that uh, I, I can figure out the direction from the vectors that I know. So I know the direction of R, goes this direction. The direction of gamma, I curl my fingers around the direction of circulation is the positive as we've drawn it. So my thumb points out that's the direction of gamma out of the out of the board here. So that's positive. So if I take my if I do gamma cross R, I put my fingers out in gamma, cross and R, my thumb points perpendicular to that, that is the correct direction. So that's what I've done here. Uh, I've taken gamma cross R hat, that gives me the right direction. So I haven't actually uh, by, by making an R hat, it's a unit vector. So I haven't changed the magnitude at all. So this is equivalent to this one. We've just now incorporated the correct direction. And also to make our lives a little easier, we'll just multiply top and bottom by R. So that I'll put an R squared in the bottom. And now I have the magnitude of R times an R hat, which is a unit vector. So now I have the regular full vector. It's just a little easier because we're gonna have that vector anyway. So I don't need to normalize it or anything. I'm just gonna do the cross product of that actual vector. Okay, so that gives me V theta. That gives me the velocity that is perpendicular to R, right? But what I need is Vn. I need the velocity that is perpendicular to this panel. And that's not quite the same. Unfortunately, last time we already computed what N hat was. We know it the normal direction for each panel. And so the normal component is just the dot product. I take this V hat that I computed, I dot into the normal, and I put a negative sign because as I've drawn it, this will be what I get for a positive value. But in the equations, I didn't really say this, but this downwash would be positive downward, right? Because it would be positive for downwash typically. And um, so, uh, so we have to put a negative sign here because this would be the positive direction in that equation. Okay, so now I've got what I need. I've got the velocity at one location from, or from one gamma, but I have to sum over all gamma. So now I get this double summation. I'm summing over I, because I'm summing, as we've seen before, summing over uh, this integral right over each panel here. But at a given panel to get that normal wash velocity, I have to calculate the influence of all the gammas from all the other panels. So I just plug in the formula that we just came up with into here and I get this uh, big summation here. Okay, so um, we can work out these cross products and do this dot product. Uh, I've done all that for you. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but you know it's just a, a kind of a little bit long, a little bit tedious. But this is the result, right? So I get this double summation as we've seen, summing over each panel and summing over each gamma, and this is the end result where I've bundled up all the ge geometry terms into this k term, and this is what k is. It's just a bunch of geometry terms. So notice I'm using the nodal points and also the middle points. Okay, and again, although this looks like it came from nowhere, it just came from this. I just, you know, did the math to expand the cross products. Actually, a lot of these simplify quite a bit because gamma, for example, is always just out of the page in the X direction that's drawn. R only has YZ components ever. Um, and N as well just has YZ components. So a lot of these terms are zero and simplify. And so this is what we get. Okay. So, so that's really it. In fact, induced drag ends up being easier than the VLM part. Once we get the VLM, uh, this is just a 2D problem, uh, no matter how complicated it is. In fact, this same approach we could use for uh, many bodies. We could have multiple wings, um, multiple airplanes even, and we just have to project everything, get these wakes, do the integral across them, calculate the influence of every vortex on every other panel, sum them all up, 
this in the same way. So uh, if you also want to make this a little more efficient, kind of like we I mentioned the VLM but didn't discuss just in the book, is that we can take advantage of the symmetry. So we only have to integrate over half the wing, but we still have to include the effect of the velocities from the vortices on the other side of the wing. Okay. So just to wrap up, I just want to mention two quick theorems that are kind of interesting um, related to this idea. One is Monk's stagger theorem. And this idea leverages what we've just talked about from the truss plane, which is if I want to know the induced drag, what we've said is that I only need to know what happens really far away. And so if all I'm looking at is really what happens really far away, I actually could have many different scenarios that happen in the near field, as long as they give me the same thing far away, then I get the same result. So just to give you an example, as we've discussed that the minimum induced drag solution for a wing would be an elliptic lift distribution. So if in the far field, I find that I have an elliptic lift distribution, then I know I have minimum induced drag for that system. And that system could just be a wing, but it could be multiple things. So for example, I could have a big wing and I could have a canard up front, All right? So this would be a canard. If you haven't seen a canard, a conventional plane has a big wing and then a small tail in the back. And it has a small tail with a large moment arm. It lifts downwards uh, and, and that's a typical uh, configuration, so the tail, you know, doesn't influence the wing, and it's relatively small because of the large moment arm. Canard, canard is different. Uh, it's generally fairly large, you know, um, and pretty close to the wing, so this is providing stability. Uh, we haven't really discussed in this class, but if you want to see my other videos on aircraft design, you can go look at longitudinal stability. We could use a canard, for example, um, there are many interesting examples of that, but the idea I want to mention here is that because the canard is big, it actually has a sizable influence on the wing. Uh, its wake is pretty significant on the wing. And so it can be hard to know, how do I design the appropriate lift distribution on the wing? But what we find is that, well, if I think about it in the truss plane, what I want, let's say for minimum induced drag, is an elliptic lift distribution for the entire system. And if I was to draw this canard, you know, in the bigger view or, or top view, let's say this is my wing, uh, the canard is gonna be pretty big, but usually not as big of a span, but that wake is gonna be influencing a big chunk of the wing. And so what I want is still to have an elliptic lift distribution out here. So what I can do is I can figure out what the canard does. And what I want the wing to do is to fill in the gap. So in other words, uh, let's say this part here is how much lift the canard produced, this is the canard, then I would want to, then I would know how to design my wing. I would say I want to design the wing so that it generates circulation as follows so that once I add the two together, project them to the far field, I get this elliptic circulation distribution. <clears throat> so formally stated, this theorem says <clears throat> that the total <clears throat> induced drag of a system is constant as long as we move uh, if we move these um, <clears throat> lifting surfaces streamwise. So in other words, if I stuck the canard into the wing, right? I just had one thing I know I want, it's elliptic. So if I move the canard up front and the wings in the back, it doesn't change anything in the far field, right? Because they're still just gonna be the same. So I'm looking at the far field, I still want, I'd still get the same total induced drag if I kept the same overall circulation, right? As long as I get the same thing in the far field, it doesn't matter. Now, of course, the details, the influences of each one's vary a lot. like the individual induced drag of the wing versus that of the canard varies quite a bit. But the total drag, the total drag of that system or the total drag of my airplane doesn't stay the same. Um, so this can be helpful, you know, in knowing how to design some of these things it can also be useful in studying things like formation of flying. Uh, it tells us at least, you know, ignoring viscous effects that um, whether I'm this close or I'm, this far, uh, I would get the same total induced drag. Now, if these are airplanes or birds, that doesn't mean that each bird is gonna have the same benefit. In this case, this bird gets a way bigger benefit, it doesn't have to work as hard because it's got more wake in front of it. In this case, it's this bird is working harder and this one actually gets a little benefit from this one. 
But what this says is that the total energy output by all these birds or airplanes is the same in this case versus this one. So a lot of interesting, useful things that can come out of this theorem. Another related one, not quite as generally useful, but interesting is the mutual induced drag theorem. That says that if I have two, say two um, lifting surfaces here, be the airplanes or wings or whatever, uh, we'll call this V infinity, we'll call this one and this two. Um, let's say we wanna calculate the total induced drag uh, from the system. Well, the total induced drag, and let's just draw, here's you know, wake one, here's wake two. So I have the total induced drag is gonna be the drag, and I'm gonna drop the I here, but this is all induced drag of one from the influence of one. So in other words, I'm calculating the drag here experienced by body one, considering the influence of wake one, which is if I have one airplane, that's all I ever do, right? Now that I've got two, I do the same thing for the second airplane, but now I have to consider the interactions. I now have to consider what's the added drag on one from the influence of this wake, right? So wake two is now inducing velocities or downwash on wake one. So I need to account for that. So that's D one two, but also wake one is inducing velocities on airplane two. So I need to include that too, right? So that's, uh, that's fine, but let's now imagine this scenario. We said that the total drag won't change if I move things streamwise. So let's say I make two, I move two very far away now. So the total induced drag should be the same. And here's my total induced drag. I still have one, one, and two, two. Those are the computed in isolation. Those don't change. But now, Wake two doesn't influence wake one. I mean, it's negligibly small, so that's zero. Wake one influences two still, and it does it twice as much. So we've moved it, let's say, infinitely far away. Right? So this is now an infinite vortex instead of semi-infinite. So the drag on two uh, from the wake at one is twice what it was before. So now this total drag is two times d21. And we just said that these two scenarios have to be the same. That's what Monk's Stagger theorem tells us. So if I equate these, I see that a bunch of things are gonna cancel out. And what I get is that D12 equals D21. So that just says um, that uh, the drag on one airplane caused by the downwash of the other is the same as the drag on the other plane, airplane caused by the downwash of the other. And they don't have to be equal sized airplanes, right? They can exert have very different wakes would be very different sizes, just that total, that uh, drag, that mutually induced drag will be the same. Okay, so that's it for today. And uh, I think that's our last topic on wing design. We're gonna start talking about compressible flow.